of humility is part of the Christian life, right? What does it have to do with carrying Christ's cross? Mother Teresa made this comment one time. Hum, humility, it, it, it's not something we just work up in, our, in ourselves to be humble. She said this, Mother Teresa, humility comes from humiliation. If you are a Christian believer, and maybe especially in the context of today's culture and the antipathy or sometimes the anti-Christian uh, attitudes, behaviors, reactions that you can encounter out there because of your faith, there's a humiliation. There's an aspect of humiliation. I myself have worked in uh, secular jobs before, before going into the ministry. And when it became known that I was a believer, a follower, a disciple of Christ, there was a price to be paid. And sometimes I was made fun of or mocked or not taken seriously because of my faith. As a Christian pastor, as a Christian chaplain working in a secular environment, there have been times when I have been marginalized or... or uh, or actually opposed in various ways. But this isn't just a lot of pastors. This is a lot of any believer. If you are faithful to being a follower, a disciple of Jesus, you will, maybe you have in some way or another, paid a price. This is the carrying of the cross we're talking about. The specific burden of being a Christian believer and the consequences that can follow from that if we are faithful disciples. So we're going to talk about uh, this way of the cross here today and um, walk through the scriptures here uh, on, on this. Uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for the cross that Christ has borne. And Lord, we remember that he has accomplished through his life and death and resurrection that which we could not accomplish for ourselves, our salvation and the life that flows from that and the hope and the joy and the peace that this world cannot ever give. We thank you, Lord, for the prize won by that price he paid. Lord, help us to be faithful in our response. Help us to carry our cross and be faithful to our Lord and Savior, whom we follow, whose disciple, disciples we are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I haven't mentioned this in a while, but remember that uh, we have these blue cards uh, next to you in the seat that talk about what it is that we believe and an invitation also to pray. And uh, so always remember that as well as a resource. And for those watching online, this is something that you call the church office and get a copy of either emailed to you or uh, put in the mail uh, for you as well, uh, what it is that we believe. And with that, let's stand and join together for opening praise. Behold the Lamb and the Lamb.
Begin our worship in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and God's people respond. Amen. Our affirmation of faith today is the uh, creed, the Apostles' Creed, and uh, here we have uh, the presentation of who God is and what he's done for us in our fellowship in the Christian church. And indeed, uh, keeping with our theme, we remember that he, God, has done it. We read this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And for our psalm today, we're going to uh, read responsively a portion of Psalm 22. And... Um, if you take a look at, at Psalm 22, and I'm going to get ahead of ourselves here just slightly and read this uh, opening section for the message for today. Reading Psalm 22, written 1,000 years before the fact, is like reading an eyewitness account of Jesus' crucifixion. The psalm ends with these words, He has done it. What has God done? And today we take a look at this psalm. By the way, and we invite you to come to our Good Friday service, and we will, as part of the service, be presenting Psalm 22 that concludes that psalm with the words, He has done it. And that is a specific prophecy, a specific uh, pointing out of what God has done through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and that this is an accomplished work. He has done it. It's happened in the past, but the effects last for time and eternity. He has won the forgiveness of sins by the shedding of his blood on the cross. We read this portion together. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The 
all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading after the psalm here today is from the book of Genesis, first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter uh, 17, beginning at verse 1, the account of Abraham and his uh, conversation with God, where God establishes his covenant promise with Abraham. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And uh, in our second reading uh, from Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul really talks about the the fulfillment of what we call the Abrahamic covenant that I just uh, read to you about and what specifically this entails, and why this is for all people everywhere. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And then finally, our gospel reading from Mark chapter 8, Jesus talking uh, to the crowd and to his disciples about what being a disciple really means. It's not a road of glory and ease, but it's the way of the cross. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. We join together for our message song, Lift High the Cross.
about uh, 20 years ago, I think it was, there was an up and coming actor, uh, A-list actor. And uh, people were very excited about this new talent. And his name is Jim Caviezel. And uh, he did uh, a couple of movies and, and just one of the hottest uh, young stars out there, a prospect. Well, he's also a very sincere uh, believer and follower, disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, he's of a different persuasion denominationally. He's Roman Catholic. Of course, we're uh, Lutherans. But uh, there's much to be admired with his faith uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and being a disciple and even carrying the cross. Years later, uh, Mel Gibson approached him about... Uh, the possibility of taking uh, the lead role in Passion of the Christ, the movie. But he actually warned Jim Caviezel or tried to warn him off the lead role because he said it might end his acting career. Why would that be? Well, because there is a bias in the world. It's always been the way. There's always been a spiritual battle between those who are followers and disciples of Christ and the world itself. There's an antip in antipathy. There's a, um, there's a feeling of opposition against the gospel. People get un at least uncomfortable if you mention Jesus in outside of the church walls sometimes. And then that's not to mention the sometimes outright opposition that can follow. I want to share with you a video, an interview with this actor, Jim Caviezel, and this is years later. And this is only part of the interview uh, he had been talking about in uh, the previous uh, section of this interview about the experience of filming Passion of the Christ and how he was actually literally struck by lightning during this, uh, during this filming and how God preserved him despite all the difficult circumstances they uh, had in filming Passion of the Christ. And indeed, his acting career did suffer after taking that role as Jesus in Passion of the Christ. But he's been very, very faithful um, about proclaiming uh, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, even in the secular world, even in Hollywood. And, but there is a price to be paid carrying that cross as Jesus' disciples. Let's watch this. And there were a lot of miracles. Uh, other than that, kind of a miracle. You mean on the set? Well, you know, we, one of the guys was a Muslim on, on the film. The, one of the uh, guards that, w that beat me. Um, converted, um, had a real big experience in there, you know, but what was going on in the, and we, well, we had so many prayers worldwide, yeah. what we were going through. And I really believe that was important because once that started okay. happening, people started what, praying for us. Those prayers have supported this film <laughs> and helped bring it this far. So what does Jim think? And, um, uh... What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the uh, subtitles. Okay, let's try that. Well, there was a during the shot. They said, "Do you have it?" But uh, and there were a lot, there of, were miracles. lot of miracles. Uh, other, other than, than that, that, kind of a miracle. Mean on the set. Well, you know, you we on one, of the, well, one of the guys was a Muslim on, Muslim on, the, on the film. film. One, the, the one of the that uh, guards me, that, would, that beat me. Um, converted, um, had, a had a real, real big experience, big experience there, in there, you know, you know but, but uh, what was, was going, going on, on in the, so and what, we had so many prayers worldwide, yeah. what we were going through, well, I really believe that was really important that was because important once that started because happening, that started people happening, started praying for us. Those prayers have supported this <laughs> film and helped bring it this far. So what does Jim think about it now? Where does this film sit with those who understand what it took to make this movie? All the actors that worked on this film, some are not going to accept it, but the opportunity will always be there for them. Here's the other thing. It will stay with the rest of their lives. Yeah. People are always going to come up to them. They'll always ask them about the movie they were in. It will always haunt them. What do you think it's going to do to your career? What do you career? think it's going to do? And if it did blow it out of the water. And if it did blow it out of the water. Right. Career, this is right? what I feel. Well, I, believe I, feel. I, believe I believe I was called to play this role. To 
I always felt in my heart, I didn't know if I was the right guy. Maybe he doesn't always choose the best, but he chose me. And I had an opportunity to say yes. And so I said yes. And so when I look out to all my fellow Americans and people in the world, I say to them, I want you to go out into this public and shamelessly express your faith in public. And that's what I've done here. And I can let it rest as it is. I don't know where, where it's going, but if it doesn't turn out, in where I'm continually working. I'm still an actor. I'll always be one, regardless if I get another job or not. But I fulfilled my mission right now. I felt what I was supposed to do right now. That's That was my opportunity. And I would have done it again. Take a look at that online when you get the chance, and you can hear it in Jim's own words, and uh, maybe get the full interview as well. It's very interesting about uh, the circumstances that happen in the making of that movie, and I would encourage you to take a look. The reference there is in your worship folder uh, about how to find that uh, online. Okay. Bring all the lights up. All of them? Good. All right. I invite you to follow along in the uh, worship folder, the outline, or on the screen uh, for the message today based upon the scripture readings that we have and keeping in mind the Lenten season that we're in and this journey to the cross and especially this idea about taking up our cross and following uh, Jesus. There's something called moral courage. And there's an aspect of what we're talking about here that's spiritual courage. And sometimes it's even physical courage, depending on how bad the persecution is. Christians around the world, uh, in other places, sometimes have to demonstrate even physical courage because of the opposition they receive, because of who they are, and because they're disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. So the question we want to ask today is, how much moral courage do we have? How much spiritual courage do we have? How much maybe even physical courage we have to stand fast in the face of persecution? Are we willing to pick up that cross of Christ and follow him and be faithful and the question I ask as a follow-on to this is, who in the world would want to do that? Doesn't life already have enough challenges and problems without strapping on the additional burden of picking up the Christian cross and following Jesus? I mean, just in the normal course of events, like other people who are not necessarily believers, we have to <clears throat> pay our bills. We have to maintain relationships in marriage or family or at work with co-workers or with bosses. We have to figure out how to get through the day and we have to deal with uh, physical ailments sometimes or problems, everything from insomnia to uh, disease to just uh, stress, emotional stress, just in the normal course of living, right? So who in the world in their right mind would want to pick up a cross on top of this and incur additional stress in life. Why, why put yourself in a position where you have to exercise moral courage or spiritual courage or even physical courage? Who would want to do that? Isn't it better just to avoid problems and just go along and get along? Now here, I want to point out that carrying Christ's cross, and this has been reflected in, in some of my own experience or, or other people's experience that I know about, you don't have to hunt down persecution. You don't have to get in somebody's face and cause a reaction by them. In fact, we're not, I'm not encouraging you to do that. The simple fact that you follow Jesus and try to live consistently will bring persecution and opposition from certain folks in certain settings. You don't have to hunt for trouble. Trouble will find you 
if you are a sincere believer and try to live as you believe. That comes with the territory. It's always amazing to me how people can hate Jesus and can hate his followers and hate his message. Think about this. What's not to like or even to love about Jesus? He came to earth, the son of God. He never hurt anybody. He never was cruel. He helped people. He never turned down anybody who needed that help. He would heal people. He would feed people. He was patient with people. And yes, he did reprove them, but it was clearly a case of them needing to be reproved and corrected. And when he did speak harshly, it was obvious that he needed to, in order to maintain truth and integrity, he needed to speak harshly. For instance, to the religious leaders who were wrong, just flat dead wrong. And he needed to point out their hypocrisy. Even the clean, cleansing of the temple where he turned over the tables of the vendors in the temple. That was an understandable action in the face of real wrong. And turning the temple of God into a marketplace. And he was right to be upset and angry. He spoke words of wisdom. He spoke things like the golden rule. He talked about the Beatitudes. He talked about him being the bread of life and the living water. He showed compassion to the outcast. For instance, to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. He went out of his way to show her God's love and forgiveness and acceptance despite who she was and despite the lifestyle that she was trapped in. He wept over Jerusalem. This is the Jesus who said, let the little children come to me. Forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. This was a loving person. And this is a person who, despite as Paul points out, while we were still enemies of God, not just, not just uh, neutral bystanders, but actual enemies of God's and his truth, Jesus, having us as his enemies, still took his enemy's sin on himself. And there, for instance, on his cross, spoke these words, Father, forgive them, for they not, know not what they do. While they were mocking him, he knows us and our failures and our flaws, and yet he still died for us. What's not the love about Jesus and his message? Why the, why the hatred? Why the hatred of his followers? I think of the people now, you know, people say, well, you know, the church is full of hypocrites, and I knew this pastor once who did this thing, and it was bad. And so they dismiss everything out of hand. But I look at the Christian examples of people I've known in my life and those who lived consistently, not perfectly by any means, because we're not perfect, but consistently as a follower of Jesus and the powerful influence they've had on my life. And I say, yes, that is truth. Yes, that is good. Yes, that is love. Yes, that is what I want to be also. As weak as I am, that's the example I want to follow. What's not to love about Jesus and the message he brings? And yet people hate him and hate his followers sometimes. So why do it? Why go through all of that? Let's, let's take a look at this. Number one. In Christ, God made and kept his covenant. God made and kept his covenant. 
God made a promise. That's what a covenant is. We also call it a testament. This is where the words Old Testament and New Testament come from. It's Old Covenant and New Covenant. Actually, it's the same covenant. It's simply fulfilled in Jesus. God made a promise in the Old Testament, in this case to Abram, and said, I'm going to make you a great nation. And through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And this is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus came from the Jews. He was Jewish himself. He came from the line of David. He was the fulfillment of the covenant promise to Abraham. There are generations, there were generations yet unborn who would be blessed. God made this promise. He made that promise in Psalm 22. The generations yet to come would be blessed. That's you and me. We've been blessed. He has done it in Christ. This is where we begin. God has done what we could not do. I don't know about you, but this makes me very grateful. We bow down before God and say, thank you that you are a promised keeper, a covenant keeper. You have done it, Lord. The promise you made to Abraham, you kept, and you're still keeping it today. So here's the thing. Let's follow this idea a little bit further with the Apostle Paul in a New Testament reading. Through Christ, number two, through Christ, I received reconciliation. Reconciliation. That is a wonderful word. It's a long word. We've been conciliated. We have been reconciled. As Paul says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And then he elaborates on this. And I know I read this, but it's worth repeating. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But then he ramps it up even further. He says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then he takes it even a step further down below, not just while we were still sinners, but verse 10, for if while we were God's enemies, we weren't just sinners, we were enemies of God, and yet Christ still died for us, being enemies, his enemies. And then he he takes the consequence of this even further. If, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him, we were brought back to him through the death of his son, not only that, not just about the crucifixion, not just about the death of Christ, but about the life of Christ that we now have. He says this, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We've now received this reconciliation because of Jesus. Here's the point. What's the motivation? I ask the question. Why take up the cross? Why assume all of this if we're just strapping on a bunch of extra pain on top of the pain we already have to endure? Here's why. We love because he first loved us. He gave his life for you and for me. Not just when we were sinners and ignorant, but while we were still his enemies. He loved us that much. I wouldn't lay down my life for my enemies like that, I don't think, and maybe you wouldn't either. I wouldn't give up my son for enemies, but God did because he loved us that much. Because he made us. He created us to live in perfect relationship with him. We wrecked that, and he fixed it. And it's unconditional. We are forgiven. It's matter uh, merely a matter of receiving that, believing it, trusting him for that which we cannot do, and living in the joy and the peace that comes from that. That's the why. When somebody loves you that much, how can you help but love them back? If we but listen. 
and let God speak to our hearts through his Holy Spirit so that we respond. We've been given this great gift of life, both now and forever. How can we not respond to that and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. It's like the first disciple. They saw something. They experienced something with Jesus that compelled them to follow him, even though it meant eventually death for almost all the disciples. Because they saw beyond life just here on this planet. This leads us to our third and final point. Because Christ took up his, I can take up my cross. He enables us to do what, what we could not otherwise do. We can't just take up our cross in our own strength. But God gives us a comforter, a paraclete, one called alongside to help. That's what paraclete means. He gives us his Holy Spirit to do what we cannot do. When we hear the word of God, that empowers us. That gives us that moral courage, that spiritual courage, and yes, even that physical courage to stand strong and stand firm. As Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the full armor of God. This is a gift too. The helmet of salvation that we have through Jesus. The sword of the spirit, the word of God. The breastplate of righteousness. The belt of truth. God gives us all of this through his word. Through these promises, through his covenant. He has done it. We just have to pick it up and put it on. We can take up our cross and follow him. And why else would we do this? Jesus asked the question, and it's a hypothetical, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a question that has its answer built right in. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? This world is passing away, and the things of this world are passing away. All those things that people chase after, that's all going to be over. But the things of God never stop. There's an eternal blessing here that we have because Jesus took up his cross and he did it for us. And so we finally ask ourselves the question, what does it profit me if I am successful in this life but turn my back on Christ? I'm sacrificing the eternal good for something that's temporal, temporary, passing away, going to be dead and gone. And like it's been said, Naked we came into the world, and naked we're going to go out. But that which we have in Christ, because he's done it, we keep forever. That's worth picking up a cross. And then for the sake of others, too. Other people, what they need. They need to see somebody who lives consistently and legitimately and authentically. They need to see the example of somebody our children, our grandchildren need to see this. We need to pray for people. We need to take up that cross, whatever the cost, because of the stakes are so high. There are people who need to be saved, just as we've been saved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I think about the examples that come to mind. Jim Caviezel. I think of my conversation this past week with Tom Majerus, my good friend. 77 years old, retired, but still saying the work isn't done yet. I think of public examples like um, former astronaut John Young, who worked with NASA for 42 years, the longest serving astronaut. And was asked, why keep going after so many years? And he said, well, the work isn't done yet. It's not finished yet. Well, Lord, as Christians, we're not done yet. But Christ has done it for us. His work has been accomplished. That gives us the strength to pick up our cross and follow him. 
and continue the good work that you've called us to do and to be. Lord, help us to respond to your voice, to your calling, to your vocation, in whatever circumstance of life we are as believers, as disciples. Help us to have courage in whatever form we need it, realizing that in the final analysis, you have done it through Jesus and that we have an eternal covenant that you keep with us. We have an eternal home and destiny and purpose here on this planet. Lord, forgive us for those times when we have not been faithful and have not acted as we believe. Lord, thank you that because Jesus has done it, that we are forgiven and ask for your forgiveness now. In Jesus' name, amen. And because of Jesus and what he's done for you, I have the privilege of declaring to you that your sins, they are forgiven. And I say this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the prayers of God's people. Father in heaven, we come into your presence today and uh, we thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you give. Lord, we pray for this congregation here. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, continue to lead during this uh, period of time uh, with the call process. We, we know, Lord, that you've already selected your man to serve in this place, and we rejoice in that knowledge even before its fulfillment. We trust you and help us to be faithful in following you and uh, carrying Christ's cross here in this place for the joy of what uh, lies before us, Lord. Help us to have your peace and confidence and courage. Father, we pray uh, for our country and for the world as uh, we continue to struggle with the ongoing effects of the pandemic. Lord, we pray that the uh, uh, vaccines now being uh, developed uh, would be effective and continue to be successful in stemming this uh, pandemic. We pray, Lord, uh, for your patience as we endure this uh, during this time. We pray, Lord, especially as believers and followers of Jesus, that we would continue to exercise uh, faith in our lives and be faithful uh, during a time that it's trying everybody's patience. Well, Lord, uh, we have specific prayers. Uh, we pray for um, Cindy's family uh, and the comfort uh, in the loss of her brother uh, from COVID. Lord, we pray for also for safe travel uh, for them uh, to Florida. Lord, we pray for um, grace. Al, Louise, Eileen, Morgan, Kelly, Sandy, Bob, and Sherry, Greg, Julie, the Stutz family, uh, Carolyn, uh, D Diana, uh, Joan, um, and a special word of thanks there, Lord, and uh, Malia, and uh, also um, for State Trooper Brian Frank. Lord, we pray for uh, Malia. Uh, uh, whose mother passed uh, a couple months ago and uh, in, in the loss of her uh, former husband as well. Father, um, today I, I again pray for your guidance and provision and strength uh, for the Biblica project, the Cop Bible. Pray, Lord, that you would open the doors for that to happen again. We pray for that. Lord, we pray a prayer of thanksgiving for uh, Carolyn. Uh, over the good outcome of her procedure that she had done. And now, Lord, we sum up all of our prayers in that perfect prayer Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and may he always give you his peace. Amen. Please stand for our closing song. Let it be said of us.
thank you all for coming and thank you for our eight people who are watching online right now. Um, I just want to make an announcement that last week was our biggest week with attendance, both in person and online. So thank you to all those who are sharing our video, who are watching online, watching throughout the week. If they're not able to watch, we really appreciate it. Make sure you're commenting or messaging me or emailing Bev or calling her to let us know how many people are actually watching with you online so we can have an even better attendance number. Um, again, that helps us with the endowment fund. Um, we have to grow by 10% in order to be able to use that 20,000 for our pastor. So it's very, very important that we have a good number. Like we work on getting that number correct. Um, so if you didn't see the email, Pastor Herb was our pastor who had the majority votes. Um, Donna did reach out to him on Thursday and let him know that he should be expecting the call process, uh, the call papers. Those do have to be mailed by snail mail, even though we're in 2021 now. Um, so it will be a few days before those probably get to him. Um, he did let Donna know he is also entertaining another call. So there is a possibility that he might not accept our call. So please pray hard for him and his family as they make that decision. And of course, keep praying for our church as well. Um, if he doesn't accept our call, we do have to come back and vote again um, that you would be okay calling Pastor Schultz. So just be prepared for that in case. Um, I'm gonna thank you all for bringing in stuff for the Easter baskets. Joan Frazier will be picking them up this week. Uh, we, My goal for the church was only six and we surpassed that by 19. So I'm actually gonna go get some stuff at the Dollar Tree after here so we can have an even 20. So um, we'll have 20 baskets to give to the Orland Park Township. And again, that has our information in there. So thank you all, everybody for bringing in stuff. And don't, some don't, uh, Eleanor donated some money so that I went and bought some stuff with that too. So, yeah, <laughs> I got to go shopping. <laughs> um, so next month, our mission of the month will be Voice for Care, and they are actually a organization that helps dis uh, families with disabilities. And I'll actually just read their mission statement for you really quickly. Their mission statement is to equip the local church to embrace, empower, and engage people who experience disabilities and their families in their discipleship walk with Christ. Uh, minister, they ministry by and with people with disabilities. So I will have a video next week. We can kind of watch what they're doing during COVID, but they will be our mission of the month for March. So I just wanted to let you guys know that. Um, I don't think I have any other announcements. Of course, newsletters, calendar, prayers. It's all by Bev's office if you need any of that stuff. And have a great week. Make sure to wave to the camera. <laughs>